We can put some over here too. People already watching. On on the live stream? Awesome. It's working. That's very important. Who are they? Uh, before now. Okay, you're live. Just go ahead and uh, adjust the volume. Okay. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to this beautiful evening in the Holiday Park. Thank you so much for coming out in what seemed like a burning hot day, but now we have a gorgeous sunlit evening with, with a sunset that we can enjoy for half of our performance. So thank you for coming out. Just a, a quick show of hands. Who is from the Holiday Neighborhood? Oh, I know there are some over there from the Holiday Neighborhood. Can we just have a quick show of hands? Yay, yay. And who, who came because of our newsletters and emails? Yay. And who just found out about this today with the Daily Cameras pick of the day? Awesome, wonderful, so glad to meet you all. Yay. So in a minute, I'll introduce um, our esteemed guest, David Kansuke Wheeler. Um, but let me just take a minute here. First off, I'm Marilyn Holmes. I'm the founder of Creativity Alive. And we are so happy to be able to come together during this pandemic and do the things that we love and share them with kindred spirits like you all. So just yay for being able to do this within this pandemic that we're in. And I just want to give a big hats off to you all for coming and just already spacing yourselves out so beautifully so we can stay safe and keep our beloved community completely safe while we enjoy each other's company. So thank you. Um, and I wanted to also just encourage you to take the memories from this evening and just consciously bring them in like the harvest from the summer the, the peaches are ripe and the tomatoes are ripening on the vines. And think about events like this, these rare special peaches, so to speak, um, that we can harvest right now and just take in because in, you know, give yourself something that you can call on when it's dark and cold and there are lockdowns or whatever may happen with, the, with this pandemic. Just consciously bring this in that this too is part of the pandemic experience, that we are able to work around all of the constraints to be able to have music and art and dance in, in each other's company. So please enjoy it, memorize, take it in. And we have a, a few things. I encourage you all to please come up to the registration table. Um, the first and foremost is these beautiful strands of Russian sage. These are also a very handy uh, social distancing assistant. Would you demonstrate with me, please? 
So not only do they smell beautifully, but if you're moving, if you're dancing, you don't have to think about, okay, are we exactly six feet apart? How beautiful is that? And if you're dancing, moving around, just keep this kind of distance between yourself and whoever is next to you. It's just a little reminder. And then they're also wonderful to take home, enjoy the scent of it. Send me pictures a week later or days later as you're thinking back on this evening. Some people started doing that at one of our last events and it was really beautiful. So, um, so take one of these from the registration stand over here. If you want to be on the email list or if you want to volunteer, we could use volunteers. There's a sign-up sheet there, too. Um, there's hand sanitizers and tissues, a thermometer if you'd like to take your temperature, um, no, information about future events, and other, other good things. Oh, the, the, the donation jar. Please, we, it, having your donations would be very helpful and very meaningful. So. Um, Gigs are few and far between, as you can imagine, this whole year. So every, every donation is really deeply appreciated. So I'd like to um, introduce our esteemed guest, David Kamsuke Wheeler. And um, let me, I could leave it as short as this quote from, where is it? Hang on. Yodo Kurashi said, who is one of the foremost Shakuhachi players, and he simply said, David Kansuki Wheeler is a great Shakuhachi master. That just about sums it up, but, but there is more. So, um, and as Mark Miller, is Mark here? Uh, Mark Miller, he's been the head of Europa's music department, and he's also a Shakuhachi player. And he wrote, in the rarefied world of the classical Japanese arts, the word master is reserved only for artists with decades of experience, a comprehensive understanding of music and culture, and flawless instrumental technique. Boulder's own David Wheeler studied the shakuhachi, the traditional Japanese bamboo flute, for over 20 years in Japan, and in 2008 was granted the honorific performance name Kansuke II. This solo concert is a rare opportunity to hear stories of and listen to the music of an internationally recognized master artist and musician, one who happens to live in Boulder. And then today, one of his students who, who is traveling so cannot attend today, he said, if you're in Boulder, Colorado, I highly recommend you attend this rare live performance by my teacher, Shakuhachi Master. Go tonight and see a true master at work and play. So aren't we the lucky one to live in Boulder, to be able to come outside into a neighborhood park and have an internationally recognized Shakuhachi player um, join us? So, and the recommendations coming from every level, his students, his colleagues, his teacher. Um, but I do have to add one more because I met David Wheeler as we were doing a neighborhood project in the Melody Catalpa neighborhood. It started as a, a simple creativity gathering where we were going to just try to bring in some of the creatives from the neighborhood to get to know each other. And I got to know this man named David Wheeler, and he was a shakuhachi player. And, and I remember asking Mark Miller at one point, it's like, oh, do you know this other guy who, who plays shakuhachi? And he said, oh, yes. <laughs> um, but I, I first knew David by driving in this neighborhood project. It ballooned from the creativity gathering into painting a beautiful street mural at, an, in, at a busy intersection in the Melody Catalpa neighborhood. And we had over a hundred neighbors from of all ages coming together last summer. And can you imagine in a square space and in, in an intersection the size of this working together on a mural. And David was right in there in the middle of the street on his knees, painting with paint on his hands, running around, taking care of everything. So he's also just a great neighbor to have in Boulder. So I'd like to... Um, <laughs> Pass it on to one, one final thing. Kansaki has done this at the top level all over the world for over three decades, including the bringing the once every four years World Shakuhachi Festival to Boulder in 1998. He loves the shakuhachi, he loves music, and he loves dance. 
and he wants you to hear, see, and share what he loves. Please feel free to relax in this environment, to rest, close your eyes, to move or dance as you feel called, to play with the scarves, whatever brings you joy and nourishment. Thank you. Okay. Well, this is Midsummer Night Stories of a Shakuhachi Dream, but um, I don't want to do just talking. Can you hear me okay? Louder? A little louder? So in 1998, the World Shakuhachi Festival was held here in Boulder, and one of the leading proponent, proponents of the, of the Shakuhachi, Katsuya Yokoyama, came. And he had been putting on these festivals. He put one on in Japan four years before that. And he, it was his dream to bring a festival like that outside of Japan. And I was lucky enough to be the person to come to Boulder and put it on. And when he came here at the opening ceremony, he stood up in front of the podium to give a speech, and he just burst out in tears, and he couldn't talk. It was a dream, a lifetime dream come true for him. He's since passed on. But at one of the biggest concerts during that festival, which was Shotaku Auditorium, we filled it, all of the attendees from all over the world took out their shakuhachis and played a piece called Tamuke. Tamuke means literally this. Namaste. It's a blessing. It literally means my hands come together for you. And he, uh, Mr. Yokoyama, conducted this piece from the stage to all 200 attendees that were circling, standing against the walls around the periphery of Chautauqua Auditorium with the audience sitting in the middle. It's a really simple piece, um, but 22 years ago that happened here in Boulder. And I'm going to play it as a solo, so it won't quite have the same effect, but Tamuke, welcome.
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome. Tamaki, that piece was probably put together about 250 years ago, maybe longer. The classical music of the Shakuhachi developed around 200, 300 years ago out of an instrument that had come to Japan from China over a thousand years ago. And it went through various iterations in Japan and finally in the hands of Zen monks, the classical repertoire that includes pieces like the one you just heard was created. And then about 130 years ago, maybe 150 years ago, it started getting involved in playing with string instruments. String instruments have been like wind instruments around Japan for a long time. The koto, a 13 string zither came to Japan around the same time as the shakuhachi with a big court orchestra, again, imported from China, where Japan gets pretty much everything, or it cer certainly it did for a very long time in its history, including a written language. I don't have a koto player with me here tonight, but I'd like to, to play you a piece by the guy that sort of established what we now view as classical koto music. This is a blind guy who lived in the 17th century, about 300 years ago. And he took a piece that already existed called Rinzetsu, which could mean many, many different things, but what that means doesn't really matter. And then he made a piece that later came to be called Midare Rinzetsu, or variations on Rinzetsu. And like I said, I don't have a koto player with me today, so you guys don't get to hear the koto part, but when the shakuhachi players started joining the string instruments, the koto and the lute called the shamisen, we would generally play the melody of the main string instrument, whatever that was. So in this case, that's kind of what you're getting. So you're getting what this guy Yatsuhashi wrote some 300 years ago and has been passed down over the centuries. Midare Linzitsu.
乱れる隣接、隣接ベリエーションです。To decide what to do next. Should I tell another story? Okay, this next one comes from the tradition, like the first piece I played, Tamuke. Blessing, welcome. Also comes from that same tradition of the Zen monk who adopted the shakuhachi as a sonic meditational practice. And not only did they meditate, but they would travel from temple to temple. And that's how these pieces got shared around between these Zen temples that these monks would travel to, between. And they would travel around the countryside playing their flute and collecting alms. And all that reminds me, I want to encourage you to give Lucas, Lucas, stand up over there. Give Lucas donations, alms. We're collecting alms.、Um, he may come around later. Don't be shy.、Um, he takes any form of currency. I don't think he'll take Bitcoin tonight, though. So, this monk was traveling around the countryside and spent a long time walking around. It was a hot day, maybe as hot as this, but it was Japan, so it was probably a lot more humid, really hot. He lay down on a grassy bank like some of you are lying down on right now. He looked up at the sky. And I ask you all to look up at the sky right now. Look up at the sky towards the west in particular. You can see the sunbeams coming through the clouds. And it's only a very special sky that I had arranged just for us tonight. I had them blow the smoke all the way across the Rocky Mountains to get this special effect. And it also makes me feel better that you're all wearing masks. Because now you actually have a reason to be on just the COVID. So, this monk was looking up at the sky and saw the clouds, and the movements of the clouds inspired in him the melody I'm going to play for, it now, for you now. And the title of the piece is Mystical Cloud Lion. Yes, and this lion was dancing. Don't forget that. I encourage you all to feel free to move as you're so inspired.
the mystical cloud line. Kumui Jishi. Okay. Who wants to dance? Everyone's too comfortable. That grassy bank is going to knock you out, I promise. Okay, I'm going to play a piece from 20th century. This also, again, sort of combines the classical traditions of string instruments and the shakuhachi. There's a tradition that sort of a form of social welfare in Japan where 300 years ago, and even longer, they had a policy that you couldn't become a professional and earn money teaching and performing in some particular arts, musical arts, and also being a masseuse or doing um, acupuncture, unless you were blind. And that doesn't tell you, that doesn't say that blind people are better musicians. But it did give a lot of blind people a way to live and a way to earn a living. It's an amazing example of socialism, social welfare in historic Japan. Well, the guy that wrote this next piece was born right around the turn of the 20th century, so a little over 120 years ago, or about 120 years ago. And he was um, cited at birth but became sick when he was four years old and lost his sight. And there was this tradition, well, if you're blind, maybe you should learn how to play the koto. So he did, and he went on to become the greatest koto master, the 13-string zither, like a harp that you put on the floor in front of you and sit behind it and pluck across the top of it. He became the greatest master of the 20th century, writing over 300 pieces that, are pub that were published, and the majority of them are still performed today by koto players. And the one I want to play for you, he wrote in 1927 when he was still a pretty young guy, but the emperor had announced that I want the New Year's poetry for this year to have the theme of seashore boulders, oceanside rocks. And you can think of the craggy rocks with the pines growing on them on the um, Mount Sanitas behind you there. You can imagine that. Imagine that by the sea. That's the image that a Japanese gets when you think of boulders by the sea. So this guy named Miyagi wrote this piece. It's called The Spring Sea. And it's got some rhythm and flow. So if you're so inclined, feel free to move. The Spring Sea, Harunomi.
Thank you, thank you. Um, in the 20th century, a lot of people, non-Japanese people, discovered the shakuhachi. I happened to be one of them, maybe 40 years ago. Um, I wasn't the first, and I'm definitely not the last. I got a new student just last month. Um, and some of you may be hearing the shakuhachi really took on a new life when it started being discovered by people outside of Japan. Jazz musicians adapted it. Um, jazz musicians, musicians in Japan adapted it. It got used in lots of movie soundtracks. You probably don't notice it because they don't say, hey, we're using a shakuhachi right now, right here in this movie. But it's been in a lot of movies. Um, and it's been in a lot of sort of new age type settings too. Maybe that's why the first World Shakuhachi Festival outside of Japan took place here in Boulder, Colorado in 1998. Boulder, I think we all agree, is the epicenter of the new age, isn't it? So I'm gonna play this long flute again, and I'm just gonna let the clouds move me and let you move me and maybe I can move you and maybe you'll all move um, and see what happens. And if you'd like to dance and throw a scarf around, lots of scarves right here for you to use for that purpose. And for you, all of you from around the globe that are watching this live stream, we hope you can imagine the experience we're having here and that you can experience that through your computer screens. Hi, world.
Thank you. Thank you. I haven't thought of a title for that one yet, but I'm thinking maybe COVID smoke or something. It's getting later. It's getting darker. I have another piece for you. Um, probably just one. It comes from the tr that classical tradition of the Zen monk playing the flute. This one is called Nesting Cranes. The crane migrates to northern Japan to spend winters. Why would a bird fly to northern Japan to spend winters? Well, it was flying to northern Japan migrating to spend the winter there because it was migrating from Siberia, which was farther north. And the crane has been symbolic of many things over the years and the millennia. And vitality, um, surviving in cold places, flying great distances in their migrations. Cranes are said to mate for life. They're said to be bearers of spiritual messages. And they're revered in cultures all over the world. And these Zen monks were developing these new techniques on their flutes. They developed some techniques that just seemed like they worked for cranes. They thought, let's use these in a song that draws the picture, that tells the story of the crane and its life. And so there's this piece, it's called Nesting Cranes. You want to say anything? I can read that. So Creativity Allies on Merlin Holmes heard this piece performed last year. And she got, thought it was pretty cool, and lately after we've been talking in the last couple of months about this event and what we might be able to do, she started to think that this might be a piece she'd like to dance with me on. I gave her a recording, and she was reminded, oh, yeah, that'd be cool. Um, it takes a few minutes, but I'd like you to read what she said about it. When I was first introduced to this piece last summer, remember last summer? that idyllic time where we ne'er had any care about masks and social distancing and breathing too heavily in the presence of our loved ones for fear of passing on a deadly virus to them. Remember those times? Last summer when I was first introduced to this piece, Tsuru no Sugomori, or Nesting Cranes, at a concert inside a beautiful temple, a sacred space where I've often danced, I so enjoyed imagining the movements of, and sounds of cranes and how their wing flutters and their cries have been conveyed by generations of shakuhachi players, as many people have enjoyed for hundreds of years. I enjoyed learning what devoted parents' cranes are and how they protect their fledgling children at the risk of their own lives. I enjoyed experiencing something of the joys and sorrows of their long, slow, natural cycle of life and how this piece of music conveyed that from nesting to raising their fledglings, to watching them fly away on their own, to return to settling back into the quiet rhythms of their long and sometimes impermanent lives. I admired all the skills and techniques of the shakuhachi, the tremolos, lisandi, flutter tonguing, irregular vibratos that are used to their full potential in this entrancing piece. I enjoyed it all immensely and then carried on with my life letting it slip away like the concert halls of our memories now, part of a satisfyingly full life. Now in the summer of 2020, as a modern American woman in the middle of a global pandemic, as a dancer who suddenly found myself without studio space, without my usual ways of dancing with others, both professionally and casually, and as a single mom of my son who is now without a brick and mortar 
in-person school. I find I'm relating to this bird and this stirring piece of music in a whole new way. After our lockdown in March, and after trying the whole online dance thing through Zoom, etc., I finally, after weeks and weeks, a couple of months really, I finally began to find my way outside in the early mornings in the parks and open spaces, far away from other people, to begin to find my way into my dance again, or really to discover it anew, to let the dance come through me in new forms. This experience has been intertwined with nature, with the birds and the animals, the winds and rainstorms, the hot sun, the beautiful vistas and landscapes that surround us in this incredible place we call home, the beauty that surrounds us in nature. I've played my Ngoni a fair bit. I found myself singing a lot. I felt like I could hear the music natural to the landscapes from shakuhachis and Native American flutes, which is one reason why it's so satisfying to have David Konske Wheeler here. Throughout this all, there's been an ever-present influence in my dance and my music from the birds more than any other time in my life. The small chirps, the long squawks, the tremolos, that come out of nowhere from beings hidden among the branches of trees, swallows who have been dancing around my feet. So when David shared this piece of music with me a few days ago, I was stirred in a whole new way. I find my imaginations of the cranes has wanted to slip away. I tried to hold on to it, but that was of a different era, perhaps of a more intellectual diversion. This is not what is speaking to me right now. In ancient times, Cranes were worshipped as spirit birds. That's what I feel calling to me now through this piece. The more vague, more deeply stirring shapes and sounds of birds from the other side of the veil. The cranes that are from within me, from beyond me. The brush of their wings against my shoulder blades that spur my wings begin to unfold again. I feel like I'm in their music, in their nest perhaps like they are guiding me with their long, patient, protective ways through time. I feel then that there is all the time in the world to unfurl and stretch out to fly again. So with this piece, I have an invitation to you. Two invitations, actually. One is to experience and witness this unfolding, this dance, this piece of music as it interweaves with movement in an entirely new way as if you've never heard it before, never heard about cranes or their cycle in life, or ever heard the tremolo from a shakuhachi before. To be in this moment in time, knowing full on the context of the pandemic that we are in, holding the present for yourself as you take this journey. And number two, the other invitation of course, is to find comfort and joy in an old friend perhaps to close your eyes and bask in the familiarity of a beloved. A beloved whom you've known from lifetimes ago and who may well, be, may well be there for you lifetimes ahead. Thanks for those words, Merlin. Is that lightning I hear? Is that thunder? I may not have to point it out to all of you, but I would like to make sure you all look up to the south and see the moon. Nesting cranes.